All right, so good afternoon, everybody. We're, we're gonna pull ourselves back. I know, um, you know, one of the real joys of having this group of experts um, and across so many disciplines in the room is that we all have so much to talk about. So we're, we're really appreciative of this, of this time together. And, and we wanna move now to our panel, really thinking about, as we talked about at the beginning, um, you know, part of our goal here today is really to catalyze conversation about how do we learn from each other? Um, and, and I was really struck by sort of three things in, in our morning session, um, three, three key points that came out that I think are really relevant to our work here in DC. And I know our panel is gonna spend some time talking about them. Um, the first is, you know, what an opportunity, right, to have, be starting a medical school from scratch and be able to really rethink just from the very beginning, not to have to break systems down, but to just start by building them the way we, we, from all of the things we've learned, we, we, we want them to be. And so I would really challenge us as we move forward to be thinking as if we are starting from scratch and what could we do? Um, and what could we do here in DC to better serve, um, Chioma, you and I talked about this, to, to serve children and families the way they want to be served and the way they deserve to be served. Um, so that was one. I think the second piece is, is this common theme across all of our states and sectors of, of silos. Um, and to, to get to that system, we really have to start breaking down silos. I would, if you haven't already, encourage all of you to look at the participant list here today because we really, if you look at the participant list, we've broken down a lot of silos just by who you're sitting next to in the room. And so take advantage of that and make some new connections. I've seen a lot of business cards flying around. That's a good thing. That's what, what we want. And we hope that this conversation really continues and I think the third thing, which is really, I think, the most important, is always framing, again, Kat, you mentioned this, our work around the concept of people first um, and using that as our North Star for thinking about how we design systems here in D.C. Um, so uh, with that, I'm going to move to our D.C. panel. I think um, mental health is, at brain health, is something that is, we know, important to not just the providers in D.C., but to our community as well. Um, many of you are familiar with the community health needs assessment that, that the um, uh, DC Healthy Communities Collaborative and others do every three years. Um, and uh, you may not know this, a little bit of a soft launch, but the 2019 Community Health Needs Assessment has just been released and again highlights mental health as a key priority, not just for our health systems, but for our community members as well. And so I think that really highlights um, the importance of us being here today. Um, so as I, I'm going to pass things over to our, our panel, again, we have a room full of experts here and we have three of them on our stage and, and, and I'm, I, like Matt, I'm going to let you read their bios in more detail, but just as a quick introduction, down at the very end, we have Mark Lavoda, who's the executive director of the DC Behavioral Health Association. And actually, probably most of you really actually know all three of these folks, so, but I'm going to introduce anyway. Um, next to Mark is Joan Yengo, who's the chief program officer at Mary Center. And next to her is Chi Yoma Aru, who is a parent support specialist for Advocates for Justice in Education and a management and policy analyst. So we're really grateful to have all three of them here today, and I'm going to um, pass it off to Mark to kick us off. Great. So uh, thanks, Lee, and, and I'm delighted to be with this panel this morning, have a lot of respect for both of them, and delighted that so many of you are interested in this topic. Uh, I was kind of told that I get to do table setting, so um, <laughs> this will be high level, and, and please don't pretend that we've got final solutions figured out for any of this. Um, it's a work in progress, and, and I hope that this launch provides us an opportunity to dig a little bit deeper. Um, like Lee mentioned, I, I run the DC Behavioral Health Associations. Uh, we're the trade association for uh, mental health and addiction treatment provider organizations in the district. We've got about 33 members and five affiliates. And, um, and I, I say that just to disclose transparently the, you know, some of this uh, reflects the lens of the provider community. Um, I have a family member with a serious mental illness, so I try to bring that perspective to all of the work that I do. Um, but, um, but clearly, my, my paid job is, is the trade association. So, um, so that's kind of those are a couple of the lenses that I bring to this work. I've been in this role for about three years and was with Catholic Charities here in DC for 11 years before. Um, so I'd like to think that, that I've started to become a local, even though I recognize that natives have an entirely different wisdom in the district. Um, so uh, so that's, that's kind of what brings me here today. Um, 
And I've been delighted to be working uh, with Children's National and Children's Law Center, and, and we keep expanding our, our collaboratives, uh, bringing Georgetown and Eason into the fold uh, most recently, and, and a number, including a number of you in the room that, that have endorsed some of the work that we've been doing, um, trying to map um, where we are right now in the District of Columbia, what the current state is for children's behavioral health, and, and also starting to articulate some principles and values about how we move forward. Uh, I was told a long time ago to put your takeaways up front. So um, <laughs> if you fall asleep during the rest of what I have to say, <laughs> then you'll at, at least have an opportunity to grab a couple things here. So first, this is a big market for mental health and addiction treatment services. There's a substantial Medicaid population. The district is a payer for 40% of all health care in the District of Columbia. Uh, so so that, that makes us kind of a novel jurisdiction in that sense. Uh, children's services are fragmented and they face meaningful gaps and district leaders are working on multiple fronts to address those issues and to advance the system. Uh, while preferred approaches may vary, there are some broad principles and values upon which almost all district stakeholders agree. I'd love it if it was all. Uh, I haven't heard dissent yet, um, but I always leave the window open. Um, <laughs> And, and community members increasingly recognize the need for treatment and are seeking help for themselves or their family members if they're in need, uh, but they want their care to be delivered in locations convenient to them by staff members and leaders who reflect the community's demographic makeup. Uh, so that's kind of the, the very high level of, of where I think the system is right now. Uh, like I mentioned, we, uh, we set out to figure out what the current state is of children's mental health, health services in the district um, and, and worked together um, to, to create a bit of, of a statement about what that looks like. And, and we broke that down into what are the current system and services, uh, who are stakeholders and how are they starting to collaborate, and what are some of the current efforts that are trying to propel us in the direction of what happens next. Um, so I just want to talk you through a little bit of what that meant. Um, we, we found a fragmented and a fragile provider network. Um, that fragmentation is true regardless of what age uh, uh, someone is seeking services, regardless if that's at the prevention stage, the early intervention stage, the crisis stage, the treatment stage, the recovery stage. It, it is a messy system. There are a lot of different entry points, which is good, um, but which one will work for you is a mystery uh, to almost everyone in the system. And so it, it can really be a struggle to get to the right front door mm -hmm. and, and then to get through the door to the care that you actually need. Um, those multiple entry points, like I said, are, are without coordination or consistent eligibility standards. We tried to document to the extent that we could figure it out for the treatment phase, what that means right now. Um, and, and across a variety of payer types, across a variety of, of eligibility categories and across a variety of needs. Um, but uh, we didn't capture everything. We, we don't have that full map for early intervention or for early childhood services. We don't have that map for uh, long-term recovery or recovery support beyond treatment, whatever that might look like. Um, and, and as the third bullet here notes, there's a meaningful gap between inpatient and outpatient levels of care and almost no attention to children's addiction services. Um, they exist, but not so much. Um, and when I talk about gaps between inpatient and outpatient, I mean both the connections, how people transfer uh, from one of those systems to the other, as well as the, the in-between level of care, um, whether that's an intensive outpatient program, whether that's a respite program, whether that's um, the, the children's residential treatment, there, there just isn't that between state for, for someone who doesn't need inpatient care right now, uh, but also isn't going to be successful trying to receive services only in a community-based setting as we traditionally think about it. Um, so, so those are a couple things about kind of the current system and services. Um, I note some of the places where stakeholders are collaborating and, and 
I was gratified that I actually condensed this list. We have a longer list in the report, um, but, but this is a couple places where that's happening. The Department of Behavioral Health has a Behavioral Health Planning Council. The Department of Healthcare Finance, the Medicaid Authority has the Medical Care Advisory Committee. There's a State Early Childhood Development Coordinating Council. There's a Coordinating Council on School Mental Health. Uh, DC Health Matters, Lee mentioned, uh, works on, on those reports about the, the state of overall health in the District of Columbia and community needs assessment. Um, like I said in the report, there are a number of others. I encourage you to take a look. Um, and current efforts, I just highlighted three, and, and there are more, but um, the, the district has its own Behavioral Health Parity Act, so I think we heard examples both in Colorado and Texas that the legislator had supplemented what the federal parity law requires, and, and the D.C. Council did the same thing recently, enacting the D.C. Behavioral Health Parity Act. Um, Bird to Three for All DC, I know many people in the room were active in that campaign and are familiar with the work that's going on there for, for our earliest uh, generation cohorts. Um, and, and we are in the process of developing an 1115 waiver for behavioral health systems transformation. And, and a lot of that is focused on adults, but there are elements of that that will uh, enhance services for children as well, and, and that's important to highlight as we think about where we are. Um, principles and values is the next document the, that we developed, and, and this is short, this is two pages, um, so I encourage you to read it in full because the spelling out will be much more comprehensive than what I can say. Um, but, but just taking a look, I think it's important to note that a wide variety of community stakeholders were able to say, we want to be sure that we're increasing access across the full continuum, the, that we need a robust provider network, that we need multiple entry points that work, that there is not wrong door, um, you will find your way, that we're addressing social and structural determinants of health, naming racism as one of those factors in the District of Columbia, that we normalize behavioral health care or behavioral health, that, that it's okay to talk about those issues, that we support family-driven care, um, that, that we want people to be at the center of their own treatment, that we're creating pathways for community engagement. Um, so knowing that there are lots of stakeholders, knowing how their voices are reflected in how the system is developed and moves forward, uh, promoting collaborative multi-organization coordination. So that's payers, that's providers, that's regulators, that's patients, and of course, patients being at the center. Um, Valuing trauma-informed care and cultural attunement. We know we need to do that, and we have to do it right. Um, we know that the ACEs study tells us about adverse childhood experiences, adverse community environments. We need to find ways to address those, but without re-traumatizing people when we talk to them about those experiences. Um, supporting tools for recovery and resilience, um, keeping that set uh, so that so that treatment is not the end and strengthening workforce capacity, uh, clearly a critical issue for so many of us. Uh, I think there are a couple distinct opportunities in the direction of high quality whole person care. I just gesture at them. I think we need to think a lot more about what that looks like, um, but beginning care for mothers and families, not just kids, the multi-generational approach is critical, taking no wrong door seriously, paying for value, but knowing that value is the full triple aim, that's clinical quality, that's patient experience, and that's cost. We can't just talk about quality in one or two of those domains, it has to go together. Um, we can't set person-centered care against evidence-based care. We like to bring in models and experience and, and we've tested on our populations in ways that weren't helpful to our populations. Um, we need to be sensitive to that and think about how the evidence is informed by people as well as people informing the evidence. Uh, we can be high tech and high touch and we should expect children to recover. Mm -hmm. I think in particular we've got to talk about time limited diagnosis, um, but that's the possibility and the expectation for most of our kids as long as we get to them. So I got to hand it over, but <laughs> look forward to chatting more. <laughs> Thank you, Mark. That's it. <laughs> Remarkable job summarizing the entire <laughs> DC children's behavioral health system in 10 minutes. So we, we <laughs> full credit to you for that. I think Joan. Okay. Um, hi, good morning. I'm Joan Yango. I'm the chief program officer at Mary Center, and I was invited to speak this morning uh, because Mary Center is an FQHC, and we have developed our own system of care uh, within Mary Center and our surrounding community partners. And I'm going to 
talk through that quickly this morning. Um, we were founded in 1988. Uh, our primary reason for being founded so many years ago was to address the issues we were seeing folks cross the border, women pregnant, often raped, trying to escape civil unrest and uncertainty in Central and South America. There need to be culturally competent, appropriate services for these women seeking medical care. And our president and CEO, Mary Gomez, founded us to provide that service. And she also had a vision recognizing that you can't just provide health care and expect everything's going to be OK. You want to ensure you have a system of care to help address those needs. So Mary Center uses the social change model, where we say we save lives, stabilize families, and strengthen communities. That model includes health care, social services, and education. And um, all those services come together and are integrated to provide preventative care, interventive care to the participants crossing the doors of our facilities. So these are our services. Um, I highlighted the ones that I feel mostly touch on behavioral health. I think it's important to recognize that health and behavioral health or brain health is health. So as we look to be truly healthy, we're looking at our health services that include our women's health program within prenatal, which includes family planning. I'll talk a little bit about that. Our centering pregnancy program in that the centering pregnancy model supports uh, women coming together at the same time through their pregnancy. And if they can talk about their pregnancy, understand where they are, and get information during that time. And during that time, it allows for social um, development among each other, building camaraderie. And it's a really strong model to help prevent behavioral health concerns later and build your social support networks. We also have Centering Parenting. And through our pediatrics program, we use the ASQ and ASQSC, and also in our pediatrics pediatrics program through work with our partners at Georgetown and our DC MAP program. We do screening for perinatal mood and anxiety disorders when participants bring their children for pediatric visits to help early identification of behavioral health concerns. Um, our education program, a key component of that program outside of some workforce development, is our early childhood education program and our adult literacy program. So we partner with Bria Family Literacy Charter School. They had been with us many years ago. And through their partnership in their order to sustain, um, they became a charter school. It's a dual uh, learning model. While the parents are learning, the children are in infant care, toddler care, or preschool. And what makes this partnership so important is that those children, and there's access to behavioral health supports, there's access to health care, and to help support prevention of behavioral health concerns, and if identified, linkage with our behavioral health program. And our behavioral health program includes the maternal mental health program, our early childhood program, our school-based mental health program, and our telebehavioral health program. Um, within that, I want to highlight women's behavioral health as part of our system of care. And so within uh, one thing that we, owe, we really need to address is if we don't have healthy moms, we're not going to have healthy families and healthy children. So we really work to support having healthy women who are planning their pregnancies, who are ready and want to be mom parents, who are in healthy relationships. And through that, we do this through our uh, Women's Behavioral Health Program. We screen for perinatal mood and anxiety, anxiety disorders. We do care coordination. One of the key programs for the women and families and partners in the program is our home visiting program. With home visiting, we work with families beginning prenatally through the child's fifth year. And that program helps to support healthy birth outcomes. Um, linkage to the family to services that they might have. And during that program, too, we also screen for behavioral health concerns and can coordinate care to link them with behavioral health services as necessary. There's other innovative programs that we've done, including a massage project, where we massage the parents of, of um, we massage the women who had young children. And that did reduce behavioral health um, depression scores. So we are very excited about that innovation. There is concerns with health access and ensuring women are healthy, especially related to some Title X changes that might happen, which may limit um, the health care access that our women receive. 
the maternal mental health program, and I have to do a shout out to the Pollinger Foundation. Mm -hmm. Several years ago, they invested in strengthening DC's understanding of maternal and mental health. And we were able to train folks to build that understanding, increase screening across mm -hmm. the city, and really develop that system of care so women could be identified early and linked with services and supports earlier so that they could be truly healthy. Um, a lot of folks know about obstacles. Just some observations related to the maternal health is funding, um, care coordination. We really recognize that in order to engage women who have been identified with a behavioral health concern, we need to help to coordinate their care so that they can have access and link. Home visiting is an excellent source to do that, but that's something that's not reimbursed. Um, we do integrated behavioral health at our federally qualified health center. So with, when a participant comes for care, they are screened with the PHQ-2, PHQ-9. If they're prenatal, it's the Edinburgh. And we, we can do a uh, warm handoff to an integrated behavioral health provider to do an assessment to determine if short-term care is necessary or longer-term care in our co-located behavioral health center. Our early childhood program has all of these services and supports um, for zero to six. And we do PCIT. There's uh, all, um, I can't see it from here, but we do. <laughs> we have a lot of different, and I say this because we've expanded it to ensure that we have child, uh, child program, psych, child parent psychotherapy, therapy, playing expressive therapies, and strengthening families and collaborative resources. That's our early childhood system, and um, that program is also the result of a partnership that we have with DCC and DBH to really support access for families with children zero to six. Uh, we have a waiting list right now. It's really hard for families to get into it, but it's something that's been very important to the community that we're serving within our system of care, and that explains all the childhood programming that we have. And then we have our school-based mental health program. One thing that we realized is that participants um, wanted to come. There were students and teachers want, wanting to come to Mary Center. It's hard to get to Mary Center. So if you really want to make sure you're meeting the needs of your community, you go out to where they are. So we're in 19 schools right now with primary prevention, um, tier one supports, tier two supports, and a lot of our work in the schools is related to therapy. So as we summarize in terms of looking at the transformation needs, that we see, we have to focus on overall wellness, public health approach, healthy women who have healthy relationships um, and can have a healthy pregnancy that's a planned pregnancy. And I can't, and I think part of that, part of the importance of that is recognizing that in order to change a system of care, we have to change our culture and how we view things. And it's really key that we look at those pieces and um, value women in that period. Additionally, we want to improve integration and communication among our electronic health records. One of the biggest challenges that we have is every, mm -hmm. every agency, every, um, and then including FQHCs, but any funding that you get, they want you to enter in their own health record. Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that integration, it just is an added burden to the, uh, to the providers. A big piece is the reimbursement. That's provided services not currently reimbursable, include warm handoffs, phone calls to family members for collateral, information coordination of care with providers at outside agencies, completing referrals for higher level of care, and talking to a child's teacher, et cetera. These are barriers to care and quality care for our system. And I'm going to scroll down to one of the big pieces, because a lot of talk this morning has been about integration of health care and behavioral health care. We need to ensure that it's trauma-informed, culturally appropriate, really looking at that system, and working with the providers in terms of training them on working with the seriously, persistently, and mentally ill population. There are challenges um, that the providers have. We, we really support integration of behavioral health with primary care, but we have to make sure that the providers who are not trained, the medical providers who are not trained to work with behavioral health participants, get that training and that support so they can be effective and responsive to the needs coming through the door. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>
wonderful. Come on, go to the and last I, slide. I think we'll, slide. we're sure. going to close it out with Chiomo, who's going to talk to us probably about the most important component of this, which is the family-centered. Thank you. Um, well, I'm glad you think it's the most important. I, I agree, and it's my you know life's mission to reinforce that significance, that importance. Um, again, I'm Chiomo Rua. Um, I work for Advocates for Justice and Education. But I'm going to spend um, more time, less time talking about particularly the work that we do at AJE, which is to empower, train, and, and organize families to help them be self-advocates as well as help their children navigate the system of care. And more into the heart of why I do the work that I do, um, what I observe with families, and also some of the trainings that I have experienced that really are helping me grow that I know that should have a greater impact in how the systems function. So I'm an African and we always give homage to our ancestors, but more than my ancestors to the point, I wanna give homage to Georgetown University Center of Excellence in Developmental Disabilities, um, particularly, and the Supporting Families Community Practice, which functions out of the department, DC Department on Disability Services, which I feel have really laid the foundation for me and how I understand um, from a disability rights and disability justice framework. Because one thing to keep in mind is that, um, uh, get to that in a second, family center chair. <laughs> one thing to keep in mind is that mental health and the spectrum of services that are required, there is a healthy population of students tackling ment mental health issues, dependent on the severity, that are nestled within the disability rights um, world and network. And th there is this friction that I'm picking up and understanding in disconnecting um, disability rights and justice and the history of that movement and that is, that is living history. Um, and to hopefully neatly bring some of the key principles there to help um, hopefully infuse what we're all doing in our different pockets, right? So one of the key things that I, um, I've learned and I'm learning is the significance of family-centered care, which is an extension of patient-centered care. And um, gosh, it looks so small in the screen. <laughs> I can't even see my slides there. So I'm just going to talk. Um, <laughs> So family-centered care, um, you know, suggests key things, right? That one, families are at the center of care, not just as recipients in that center, as in different people throwing things into the middle of the circle or the table, but also um, as, uh, as what the umbilical cord plays, right? That, that place that feeds the entire system. With the intelligence of the lived reality, of whether the system is working or the system is not working. I mean, you know that the, the best measure of that is the experiences of the families, which can be measured in different ways as Mark, I just really look forward to reading the mm -hmm. report, um, can tell that story in a whole nother way through data. Um, but also through, our, through how we interact when we come in through whatever doors that we come into. And family-centered care, assumes that families are an authority, um, that family is an institution, is an organization in and of itself, and that everything else in society that houses the individual, and that everything else in society is to strengthen, uphold, advance, and push forward the, the best interests of that organization, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, I guess a, a critical thing that I think maybe, um, considering my time is like flying away as I'm <laughs> talking here, um, is in decolonizing the concept of family, right? Because I also find in my work is I'll go in, I'll support families to attempt to get services within the school, attempt to access the healthcare system, um, is that dependent on the parent and how the parent shows up, that can be a key determinant in access, which sometimes people are like, that's just the way the world is, that's the way it works. Mm -hmm. But I refuse to accept that um, because the consequences are just too detrimental in our human rights violations, in my opinion, right? And, and part of that adaptive work is in really IDing 
um, and honoring different kinds of family and just the concept of family. That it shouldn't matter if I have a PhD or not. It shouldn't matter if I'm married or not. It shouldn't matter if I have a disability or not, if I'm a grandparent, if I'm an auntie that happens to have it to step in because mother and father are going through certain things, that the family means a lot of things to a lot of different people. And of course, the legal implications to, you know, who has the authority within a unit to be a key decider on a child's care. But I find that the law is not what's in the way oftentimes, right? Mm -hmm. It's in recognizing that if you see a family that comes from an immigrant family, a, a family struggling with homelessness, uh, a single parent family, a two parent family, where maybe one of the parents is incarcerated, you're, uh, the judgment set um, at the offset of really interacting with that family will determine a lot of what actually, mm -hmm. whoever meets them at that front door, whatever work they've done um, to deal with uh, their understandings of who they're serving and why they're doing what they're doing, that matters a lot. And so staff training is something critical and important in terms of really unpacking, which is along the lines of culture and, un and, and knowing that culture is bigger than if you migrated <laughs> to the United States or if you are an English language learner. Culture is in everything. The, uh, the organism, you all, you, we all have our cultures. Even how we're practicing right now, this has a cultural orientation of how we receive information, which may not be neatly, because the last time we had this, I brought my six-year-old um, on the spectrum, and he has a different cultural orientation as to what a meeting should look like as he was parading <laughs> up and down. And to him, his culture is to move around, hard. right? And that's perfectly all right. It was beautiful. <laughs> right, right. He's causing trouble elsewhere today. So he's not um, but I think also a critical understanding uh, for me, because my true discipline is political science, is to understand that really, yes, there's a lot of internal work we all have to do when we meet people through whatever doors they come through. But there is just a fundamental concept of participatory democracy that families are at the nexus of showing integrity of any system, right? So that, that so it's never an either and or to me is can you serve the parents and the families and the children and include them in your decision making processes mm -hmm. and include respect their autonomy and authority, especially if it's mandated by the law, um, that you go through certain processes in order to show that respect. And the only way that I know how that whole integrity is, is truly checked and pushed forward is through inclusion. So mm -hmm. if your organization or your government agency does not have an advisory council mm -hmm. that includes parent voices, I feel you're doing something not completely correct that is democratic. If you're making key decisions and you are deciding to change a key policy that's going to directly impact your constituents and your clients, and whether you're in the private sector or in the public sector, and you don't have processes, and you don't have voices of people who are receiving your services, then I feel that that will also impact your results, your outcomes. And better yet, not just your outcomes and your bottom line, but the outcomes of the children in which we say we all care about, right? So. Um, gen democracy is a key point. Um, I'm clearly not going to get through everything in my slides here, but um, you know, reiterating something that Mark said that's really important. One thing that the Georgetown you said, one thing through the supporting family COP, um, one thing that I'm, I'm also seeing through our process in the coordinating council and school mental health is that yes, we really need beyond theory, beyond concept in the District of Columbia, a really great robust system that. Any door you walk through is not is a door in which you can begin to be identified as needing health services of any kind. Um, if you've never had to stand in a welfare line, if you've never had to deal with transitional housing, if you've never had to deal with your child's delayed um, learning or um, maladaptive behaviors that are just spilling out everywhere, um, and you still have to function, um, go to work, 
and, and be a productive member of society, if you don't have that lived experience, it may be difficult to fully understand why every door matters, why I should be able to go into the library and there be somebody there to say, hey, okay, I see something's happening here and I wanna make sure that you have some information that's useful and helpful for your family. Or if I go to a rec center or my kids are in school or even at the movie theater, I really, feel, I mean, we can, we can speak about the broader um, forward moving uh, motion that families want this to go. I know that the system is paced. I know that <laughs> I'm learning to pace myself and be patient in, in how, how much can happen and in what time and capacity they can happen. But I, you know, I just wanna end on saying some things that I think are important. Um, you know, I've started to try to conceptualize, this is just my bad use of, um, very novice use of technology here to start to graph out my concepts and ideas. But I think one of the best um, laws that have ever existed to protect families is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Mm -hmm. I mean, it spells out so much from the beginning, from early childhood, through the life to secondary transition. Once you hop in and you're learning till you supposedly hop out and are now a productive member of society, there is a process at every step. And I think some of those processes um, should be not so feared or um, understood as like these mandates, which is part of the adaptive change. Like if I have, to, if I got a dollar for every time I sat into an IEP meeting, whether it's my own children's IEP meeting or their, um, or another family that I'm supporting at an IEP meeting, and the IEP team really has this hostile position, mm -hmm. um, you know, and and literally you walk in to unnecessary war, right? Unnecessary battle. Um, and, and and that that has its traumatizing impact, right? But yet the whole concept of that process is set up to be empowering for everybody in an interdisciplinary way. So to me, it's never either or on a family-centered or evidence-based. There's evidence to show that if you have family-centered practices, you are better off in terms of the services and the long-term outcomes. And I can, you know, maybe in the Q&A, I can speak to more details as to what, I, what I'm trying to paint here around putting the families in the center, having coordinated care, having systems in which there, um, there is true collaboration between the medical model and the social model, and that schools really understand their their um, their roles in in that as a conveyor, as um, as as a central hub in which students can and children can receive their services and families can truly participate in it. And I'm growing in this process, and I look forward to future opportunities to deepen all that I'm learning. Thank you. Well, thank you. That was actually, I think, the perfect way to, to close some of our formal conversations. We do um, still have about 10 minutes for questions, but I, I also just want to add, I think, uh, Chima, to your point, um, and, and really reinforce, you know, we, as we've said a couple times today, we see this as the beginning of a conversation. This is a, a light touch on a lot of topics, and, and our hope and goal is to really um, um, take this opportunity to then start to take these ideas that are starting to brew in everyone's minds and really dig in and see what that would look like for DC. So um, we have, I think, about 10 minutes, right, for questions um, for our panel here. And then and then Matt and I will do uh, make a few remarks to close us out um, and think about next steps. So, um, and I'm going to defer my questions because I know our group has a lot and I already see a hand back there. So please. All I can see is a hand. I can't see a face. So. I'll, I'll <laughs> oh, great! Please, please. Yeah. Marla Dean, um, Bright Beginnings. I have a. I don't know if there are questions or comments. Um, you can help me. The first one is um, to the gentleman who talked about the coordination in D.C. And one agency I saw or didn't see that I think is instrumental to this conversation is court social services or juvenile probation. Um, so I just wonder what's happening there because I think about the conversation that is happening in my own community. I live in Ward 7 and how um, children are often blamed 
for crimes that they're actually not committing. It's actually kids who are actually older than juveniles. Um, but this conversation is in some ways stigmatizing young people. Mm. Yet, on the other hand, I do know that there's a lot of supports that need to happen specifically in this age of um, human trafficking. Mm. Um, so I just wonder how they're being brought into the conversation. The second, that was a comment, here's the question, <laughs> I, or whatever it may be, I don't know yet. Um, so at my um, organization, we think a lot about family. I mean, we think, we have this conversation all the time and it's really um, hard to get our hands around. So we believe that your family is whoever you define it to be. And that's just the, the easy part of the conversation, but the, here's the hard part. Who all do you get to talk to? Who all do you collect data on mm. to see if you're um, supporting the family, moving the family? How do you track all that data? That's where it becomes complicated. When are we sure that we've considered? When is it instrumental for us to have a conversation with a family member who's a little bit estranged but still important to the conversation? So it's we have this ongoing conversation about family and family outcomes, but actually figuring out a way to facilitate that and track and monitor and know the impact we're having and what we need to do is often more difficult because my agency in particular serves children and families experiencing homelessness. Mm -hmm. So for the first of your comments about uh, justice involved youth, there, there's a lot of work that needs to be done to understand that system and that wasn't something that we were able to tackle with the effort that we devoted to uh, just figuring out what's happening in the treatment system. Um, we did devote a couple paragraphs to kind of where you start to seek that information, but, but that, that is, that's another important project and, and I think we should all recognize that uh, to the extent that they're not part of the conversation, we need them to be. Mm -hmm. um, and, and to address the, the, the latter question um, around family outcomes and just to be clear that I, I'm hearing you right, you're looking for better ways to measure um, or to identify rather um, how your, your success is in engaging with the families, is, is that? Is that accurate? Uh, yes. Yes, we're looking for ways to figure out, are we engaging with the right family members? Are we including the right family members? Because it gets complex, especially when you have very complicated circumstances of families. When you spiral down to a situation where you're experiencing homelessness, a lot of things have happened with family. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I would say, so there are a, few, a couple of things I want to say is that one, it takes a village, right? Like um, the population that you're working with has a relationship with Strong Start, most likely, right? Aussie. And, um, and, and you get to participate in some of their professional development opportunities and training, as well as the resources to help enhance that family experience. I would, I purposefully say this knowing that they're Perfections that need to happen with that relationship be between the CBOs and 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 the program um, regulators. Um, but the more you lean, the, the greater. And there's technical assistance um, um, uh, organizations that are designated to troubleshoot these exact things. I'm happy to speak offline with you some of that. I want to say I just recently comp completed my certification in early intervention. Mm -hmm. At, at the Georgetown you said. And one thing that um, that's very central to that, that I think may be helpful and useful as a tool, it, and it's underutilized, is this concept of parent coaching, right? Like, um, I feel that using parent coaching and using parent coaching tools, um, and I, I love parent cafes, I, I go to as many as often that I can get to, and we're, we're working in-house to specifically um, de designing parent cafes that address um, children experiencing, families experiencing developmental delays and disabilities and targeting that population for cafes, because oftentimes, because I go to cafes for fun, wherever I see them pop up, I see that the, the specific lifestyle um, of families experiencing adverse 
things, whether it's happening to their child or happening to them in their lives, um, can be unpacked in a politically empowering way, right? Um, with the rights and privileges. So I want to say that through parent coaching, there's an empowerment that's happening, but there's also a relationship that's happening where in the time you, you get to engage in a crisis or when key decisions need to be made, especially around transition um, out of the birth to three and into the, the rest of the world, to me, that's where all my traumas came from, to be honest, is that transition out. I would say that that parent coaching model, um, a parent, and there are different models of parent coaching, but parent coaching, once that relationship is established and that trust is there, where somebody is constantly working on goals, particularly goals, self-identified goals of the unit to say, hey, this is what I think is important for my child to learn. Whether it's, it's legitimized or not, there is a relationship there to sort that out and to keep the child at the center so when there's a dispute or disagreement or whatever within the family, within the school family relationship, that when you really have that space where there's somebody on the job or a few people on the job to relate to that unit, you will have the authority, the leverage, the the ability to identify, okay, this is the this is grandma makes all the decisions. She's the matriarch mm. here. You know, she may not be the legal guardian, but what she says goes. So if I know that things need to happen, I know to go to grandma. Right? That relationship needs to be established, but I think it has to be beneficial for the family because they're, you know, through because of many reasons, it's their right to be private. Um you know, you have to bring something to them. And I think parent coaching is a non-threatening and life-enhancing way to build relationships with families that shows that, yes, you are building your rigor to parent a child, especially if that child um, is showing signs of behavioral health concerns or other, the spectrum of disabilities, right? So that's my thoughts on it. Awesome. We're just gonna, this is Kat. I was gonna add one small thing to it. I completely agree with that. and. Um, I think there's a couple examples in some of um, our model where we've seen that family coaching slash parent coaching can happen in exchange for other services or other privileges as well. For example, one of the places, not that this is the place to start, but that we're um, implementing it in Travis County is um, for families or parents um, of people who are, ha are coming out of either the juvenile justice system and or the adult justice system. There's some opportunities where we're testing out doing some trainings with those families to understand the mental health conditions that their family member has who's about to come back to the community. And that earns them extra visits. It earns them different things. And so if the family goes through those trainings or the parents go through those trainings, they can actually earn things. That's just one example. But I think that's another way to think about it, about how you have a chance to interact and how you design the experience for those family, whatever that's going to be, parents, um, to, to give them the opportunity to learn about this person in their life. That's great. So I think we have time for probably one more, one, one maybe two more questions. I mean, I'm being told we get a little cushion here. So um, uh, I, I'd love to take another question. So I know there must be one. Well, I will, I think everybody's processing, but I'll, I'm gonna actually just take the prerogative um, and ask our panelists, just like in in maybe two sentences, given that there's a bunch of you, you know, what's, what, what, if you could, if, if you could make a recommendation for just one change, one thing to do um, for us as we move forward here in DC, what, what would that be? Uh, and you had oh the misfortune, I guess, of sitting at the end. <laughs> well, and I think I have the misfortune of looking back at a six-year haul that I'm exhausted. You know, we've got my team is exhausted. And I think, you know, I said this on a, we just videotaped a, a message. A, I think we all have to hold ourselves accountable that we are part of the silos we've created mm -hmm. and that we are the opportunity to change and to connect starting with the funding programs, uh, you know, yeah. all the way down and up. Um, I think we owe it to ourselves and our communities to be more accountable to breaking that down. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, have to. <laughs> um, I would say moving forward, it would be keep the conversation going. 
a lot of our stakeholders, because Texas, we have two legis every other year legislative session. Mm -hmm. um, we got kind of quiet during session. It calmed down. People were at the Capitol. So keep the conversation going throughout that time, even if your teams aren't meeting because they are at session. Um, engage them, update them, let them know that the, prog the progress of the project is still moving forward to keep them engaged throughout mm -hmm. the time. It's hard to pick one. Um, I think I would say, first of all, I just love that you're starting with children and adolescents because if you really keep stepping back and stepping back and saying that's where this starts, like that is really the right place to start. So I love your focus there and I want to um, congratulate you on that. Um, I just really, as you get started, map the current system. Like I can't say it enough. It's just I bet everybody in the room, like this is what we found, thinks they know what the system looks like and you all have different versions. So when you map it, it becomes this <laughs> artifact that allows you to have the conversations and see it and then share that map with the people because people are trying to navigate this. And so the more everybody can see it together, like that's transparency and that's where you start to see opportunities for change. And I just can't advocate for that enough. I think it, it really changes the way people look at the opportunity as well. I think I'm still on. You're on. Okay. Um, <laughs> So, one thing. <laughs> Stay engaged, please. I mean, that's, that's my humble request. We need all of your expertise. We're not going to be able to do this without a lot of the people in this room and a lot of the people that you know consistently being part of the process. And, and my experience in three years in this role and 11 years at Catholic Charities doing grants and contracts as government is slow and influencing private philanthropy is slow and influencing <laughs> the market is slow and <laughs> mm. I, I really appreciate the, the, the language around urgency and patience. Yeah. We're going to have to have both. So, so please stay with us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I, I think DC has really, really come a long way in terms of the early childhood system. I've been at Mary Center for 21 years. And when I started, we were just beginning. There are people in this room that were with me when we were just beginning to look at early childhood mental health. So we've come a long way. And I think we have to continue to build on the systems of care that we are developing, bringing people together. I appreciate the mapping piece. I think mapping so we can see all the different players and organizations and where the gaps are so that we can build on what the successes are and improve upon them. I don't want us to be starting again next year. Um, we have challenges in DC when administration changes and leaders of different um, agencies change and having to re-educate. So if we come together as a community and can really build, continue to map what's already been done and build upon that, I think we can make great strides moving forward. Okay, so I'm gonna try and put three concepts in one. <laughs> invest in family leadership, like really invest because of the impact on needing more creative and robust care management systems, particularly through transitions. Transitions from birth to three into pre-K to 12. Transition from pre-K to 12 out, whether it's higher learning or job. The middle school, elementary school to middle, middle to high. There are these very rough spots um, that are very painful for families, especially if the child has as a, um, a need, a mental health need, um, to, to have continuum of care um, in the medical model, social model. But the family leadership, investing in family leadership, to me, suggests that if you have a job description and you're putting it together and you're like, you're looking for, you know, somebody with hard skills, you know, that are great, incorporate some soft skills, including understanding um, family relations, whether they are, they are a family advocate and have navigated the system or are um, have worked with many families or a combination of the two, like that experience and that level of expertise is severely undervalued, but deeply needed. And um, especially those in government, you'll know, like 
it's deeply needed based on what you get at your front doors, right? That's wonderful. Thank you. I, I first actually to say thank you to all of our panelists. Um, I think it's really, um, we appreciate all of your respective expertise and, and, and I think really have given us a place to, I, I don't even want to say launch because I know that quite a bit of work is already happening, but perhaps a place to reinvigorate um, and really think about, I, I think we've used the um, analogy of the Trojan horse a couple times today and I think one of the things to remember about the Trojan horse, right, is that when it goes through the gates, the, the flaps sort of open and there's a whole army of soldiers that comes out. And this is our army of soldiers in the Trojan horse. And so I think um, as, as panelists and your experiences and, and insights have really given us um, a place to reinvigorate our efforts as a part of that Trojan horse.